if he really wanted to follow a music career, I would be all about that. I want him to find his path. But having said that, there's certain non-negotiables. If he's my son, he's going to get a jiu-jitsu black belt. I was carrying her out to the car from the backyard. And I did have that moment, Lawrence, where her elbow's here. And I was like, I could be a fucking hero right now. All I got to do is just jam that elbow right back into place. And then I'll, I'll have saved the day. You know, I don't know how long I'm going to have with them. So I try, I'm sorry, I know I'm, it's a bit emotional, but I just, I wanted to share that with you because it's really been on my mind the last two days. And when you're talking about parenting, and the way you are with your kids, it's also the way you are with your parents as well. Welcome to You Got This, Dad. This is the inaugural episode, and I'm lucky enough to be here with my dear friend, Lawrence Dunning. Lawrence, can you please tell everybody where you are, where you came from, and how long you've been a dad? And then we'll jump into the meat and potatoes. Inaugural guest, I'm super honored, and it's such a pleasure to be with you. Um, I've been a dad for a little over three years. I'm from London, England originally, but I live in Northwest Indiana, just south of Chicago. All right. So what I want to start with, with every guest and with you, especially because we've talked about this before, what is um, the best advice you ever received from your father? I have such a, I have so many wonderful memories. I'm going to talk all about this of, of my dad growing up. He was such a, an amazing father. There was something there was a couple of things that he didn't do though. And, and one thing is I feel like he didn't really have a, a lot of philosophical conversations. He just, it was more, he just, he was just an involved dad who was super present and he gave me a lot of love, but it wasn't one thing that he didn't do is kind of give me, you know, kind of life advice. I think he, he really wanted me to figure a lot of things out. And I think there's a lot of benefits to that, but there's a, a lot of drawbacks too. So for instance, I became a professional athlete when I was 30 to 35 and I felt like a lot of that was desire that I wish, like I used to say, I wish when I was competing in high school that he had kind of encouraged me. Hey, I was I was running the used to run the mile. I wish he'd, he'd encouraged me, like, hey, we, you got to you got to race in six weeks. Let's go to the track and let's do sprints and you know try and motivate me. He just kind of went about his days like yeah, he's got to come. Everything had to come from me. So eventually it did, but it had to come a lot later. And so I think there's, you know, I'm so happy with where I'm at. I'm turning 45 next month. I'm so happy with where I'm at. Yes, if I could live my life differently, would I have done, you know, a hundred things differently, of course, but then I wouldn't be who I am today. So I'm really happy for all my failures. Um, but that's one thing that as a dad now, I can't wait to have those kind of conversations where I try and give my 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 son wisdom and, and, and life philosophy. Um, but at the same time, it's so weird because so many things, it's one thing being told something and it's a very different thing learning from experience. And I feel like, you've got to let we're going to have to let our kids experience a lot of heartbreak and pain themselves to really learn the lessons we just have to make sure it's not too severe and they can come back from it where did he sort of insert himself the most in your life was it around you know finances or love or athletics or education where was he the most prominent if he sort of sat back i guess with you know your your athletic endeavors where was he the most prominent in your life so he had a very tough upbringing. So my granddad was, um, he smuggled out of Germany just before the Second World War. His father was a Holocaust victim. He was half Jewish. So they smuggled into England when he was 17, didn't speak the language. He was a bitter, broken, angry man, having dealt with everything that he dealt with. And then when he got married very young, he had my, my dad and three other kids. And he had a lot of issues and it was a very old school German mentality where the mother raises the kids, he makes the money and he didn't provide them much love. He was, he was kind of in, in many ways, kind of a very harsh, um, kind of nasty man. And my dad had a very tough, well, he had a very tough upbringing in that sense, but my dad had a very nice mom who gave him love. So when my dad had kids, he was very much of the, of the opinion that, I just want to give my kids a loving family unit. And so I guess it would just be love. The, the one thing that on every metric he couldn't do better than was just give me attention and love for sure when he was there. But he was a pilot. So I remember like growing up being very close. I was always a daddy's boy. He would be, he'd be home for a week and then he'd be gone for maybe a week. And I remember lying in bed being like, oh man, like six more sleeps till I see my dad again. And it's, it's, wow. It feels like a long time. Um, so I'd really miss him when he was away. But then when he was home, Unlike today where, you know, I, I work in real estate, so it's a weird schedule and I work weekends and nights and, you know, I, I have an odd schedule I have to juggle. When my dad was home, he would have five, six days where he had nothing. There was no cell phones. 
the, the, the work didn't bother him. He was off and he was off completely. He could make us breakfast. He could take us to school. He could pick up, pick us up from school. He could hang out, take us to the park. He had no stress. And I think that's something that the, the, a lot of jobs in the previous generation, just when they were at work, yeah, they weren't there and they weren't available. But when they were home, they were really home and present. And that's one piece of advice I've got from a lot of people I've talked to on fatherhood is when you're there, be there. Don't be sitting next to him physically, but be your your mind is is 100 miles away. You're texting people on the phone. You're scrolling Instagram. That's not with your son, you know. So that's, that's a constant challenge that I've been dealing with because I use my phone for work is if I want to be with my son, I can't have my phone because I'm either going to have a client call me or I'm going to have something. I've got to text this guy back. I have to leave my phone upstairs. I go down in the basement. I play with him. I can't even have my phone there. You know, it's, it's that constant challenge of the uh, of the, the the modern workplace for so many people and so many careers, especially entrepreneurs, is you just it, it's really hard that, that the boundary between work and life is very blurry. Well, yeah. And, uh, you know, the other thing to be conscious of there is that you're modeling that behavior, like that's the norm for you to always, you know, be on your phone and doing two things at once. And it's just sort of a very um, distracted uh, kind of impression of the world that they grow up with. Like, okay, well, I can't wait till I have my own device and I can be doing two things at once too, like my both of my parents. Um you know, you look very young, Lawrence, but I am noticing a little bit of white in the beard. How old were you when you, so you became a father at 42? 41. 41. Yeah. Okay. How did you prepare for that? Um, you know, I realized, I didn't realize this till later. One of my favorite quotes is um, by Soren Kierkegaard. And he said, life must be lived forward, but it uh, can only be understood when we look back. And so when I look back at my thirties, the whole time, but I always hear these little comments from my friends with kids like, oh, that's cool. You're doing that. Enjoy it now. Because, you know, when you have kids, it's all going to stop like these little, little, little comments. And um, it was obviously affecting me because I was always very fearful of, of having being a father because I thought <laughs> my life would end all the fun things that I enjoy doing that I can just jump on a plane and take a last minute trip. I can be selfish with, you know, athletic goals or whatever it was. Um, not that I'm a bad person, but I, you know, I'm, I was a, striving to be a high achiever when I was young. And I always assumed that the parenting would curtail that. So I had all this negative, these negative, um, it, whether it was, I think a lot of it was subconscious. And I remember when my wife gave birth, completely fucked up situation. I couldn't be there at the birth because she, when we went into the hospital, they said she had COVID. So, so they basically within a few minutes kicked me out of the room and my wife was crying and scared, of course. And they just basically pushed me out of the out of the room and said, you know, you can't be here. So she gave birth alone and I couldn't see them for, I think oh. I had to wait 48 hours, get a negative test and then pick them up. So for a few days, I was a dad, hadn't, I was a dad on in, but I hadn't even seen, seen them. So I was, I was doing a lot of soul searching and I was incredibly depressed and I was very angry and frustrated that I wasn't there. I felt like a bad, you know, bad husband because I wasn't there for my wife, but I was, I had this real depression and I didn't understand why. And I went for a really long run. And I realized that it was all this subconscious imprinting of all this negativity towards parenting. And like, you know, it's, it's, it's almost, it was almost saying you have to be a certain person when you become a parent, you can't be the person you were before. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a less, less person. Yeah. You know? And so I went for this long run and I was thinking, but why, like, why, of course life is going to change, but why, why does it have to be worse? In many ways, I felt this inspiration, you know, I felt, I felt inspired before I had this feeling that. Yeah, it's cool. Like, you know, I, I achieve a goal and I, I take it off, you know, my my uh, metaphorical, you know, goals list or bucket list or whatever you want to call it. But it, it it got to the stage where as I got older, it just it all a lot of it felt kind of it wasn't even that like, what, what am I doing all this for? Whereas when I became a dad, even before I saw him, I had this feeling of legacy. Like now I have an inspiration. Now I have someone who I want to teach by example, not just by words. I want him to see me struggling and, and, and pushing myself and, and striving for greatness and um, trying to do hard things and be, be my best self. And that's kind of what I think I've really found. It wasn't easy. It wasn't overnight. It took a few years, but I found this incredible happiness and inspiration through being a parent that I didn't even know existed before. And that's what I want to tell my friends who are kind of on the fence about having kids is if you and I look at anything we're proud of, Thomas, I promise you it wasn't the easy thing. It was it was one of the hardest things we've done. 
And it's the same with parenting. Of course, there's so many times where, yeah, it is hard and it does change your life and you are a little tired and you can be a bit grumpy, but the pleasure you get from it, it's something that you don't know what you don't know. And before you become a parent, you don't know what that feeling is like. And it just, it gives me so much happiness and inspiration for the future. And it's, it gave me a whole new mindset. Like before I wanted to, again, talk about ticking the box in life. I wanted to tick a box in life. Like, okay, I've made enough money. I'd never have to worry about money again. You know, tick these boxes. Whereas now it's like, I almost don't want my success tomorrow. I want my success spread out over the next decade because I want my son to see me. I want him to, to model to, to, to be modeled that good behavior where it's not easy because my dad bought a bunch of Bitcoin 10 years ago and he has millions of dollars in the bank and he never has to worry about anything and he can sleep in till noon and walk around his bathrobe watching Netflix. He has no care in the world. I want him to see me, um, you know, trying to build something great through hard work. So I, I love that. I it, just the inspiration I've got from fatherhood is something that I could never have imagined before. And also the happiness as well. I think it's just, it's, it's almost like, um, there's there's so many there's so much statistics where it's almost like um the the family unit that was so prized two generations ago is it's almost like society in many ways has become anti-family and there's nothing wrong with um unusual um you know family units but that there's so many statistics that if a child grows up in in a two-parent household you know he's he's um 20 or if he doesn't grow up in a two-person household he's 20 times more likely to end up in jail and, and you know there are all these negative statistics and um and i don't know if you know this thomas but i just learned the other day it's not about a parent about a boy growing up in a two-parent household it's actually a boy growing up with his father so if it's a single dad who's raising a son he's still um much much less likely to to be in a bad situation to go to jail to things like that then um, it, it's not about a, a single parent. It's about a a boy having a father figure because he needs that father figure in his life. The I've never of, heard that statistic. Is that where's it, what's the source wild. on that? I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, but I have heard it from a couple of different uh, sources. I think they're, they're reliable. Um, I think it was in parenting books I was reading. But we got to throw that. We got to throw that in the in the show notes because that's Definitely. like that's a huge, huge, huge statistic. And exactly wow. because it. It's it's not that you know, uh, of course you know you and I both know a, a mother's bond with with their kids is just it's invaluable but there's something about boys and needing a father figure um, especially when they become older and they're teenagers they they need that um, that role model or you know the, the statistics are not good so um, these are all just fascinating things that I think it's good to emphasize because society seems to be in many ways moving almost against. Uh, the family unit. And there was so much fear about, I remember when I grew up, when I grew I don't know, Thomas, you and I are similar in age. There was a thing in, in the air when I was growing up that the biggest problem in, in with the planet was overpopulation, overpopulation. And now suddenly we're hearing the other side of that. And it seems like now a lot of smart people are worried about, you know, declining fertility rates and underpopulation and things like that. So, um, man, our generation has really grown up with everything. You know, we, we've had the entire, um, internet revolution now smartphone revolution now ai is around the corner which terrifies me and um and then on top of that we've we've it just in our short lifetime we've seen problems about population being too big to now they're worried about fertility and 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 and, and you know the the, the end of the, the, there's not going to be enough people to repopulate so it's just it's just wild wild times we're living in but i think the, the one message that i want to spread with this long rant is Parenting is amazing and don't let people, a lot of these people don't even have kids, um, tell you otherwise. Two things. Um, did you buy a bunch of Bitcoin 10 years ago? Because sadly, no. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, um, all right, look, I've known you since um, May 11th, 2019. And you're a bit of a control freak, Lawrence. You, you kind of like you want everything just so. And I think it, that's part of what has allowed you to achieve so many things. Um, as far as your son goes, when you see him doing things that you don't particularly approve of, or you're like, Ooh, I don't know if that characteristic jives with, you know, my tenacity and pugnaciousness. Um, how do you pull yourself back and go, no, Lawrence, you're trying to be controlling again. Just let him be who he will become. At what point do you feel like you need to step in and 
sort of mold him into mini Lawrence? And at what point can he just be himself? It's a fine line, no? God, that's such a good question. Um, when I was, if you'd asked me before I had kids, oh, do you know, are you going to be a, are you just going to let your kids do whatever you want? So you're going to try and be controlling, you know, I would be like, let, let kids be kids, just whatever. He can play, he can fall, cut himself, <laughs> blah, blah. And then as soon as, when you, when you had, like, I remember going to Italy when he was young and I'm walking on all these cobbled streets and I'm just, I'm just ready to grab him if he falls because I don't want him to split his head open on the, on the, on the, the cobbled stones. You know, it's like, it's, it's trying to figure out the um, let, let kids learn through falling and trial and error versus, you know, I'm worried about concussions and things like that. So that's, that's definitely a fine balance. Um, I'm getting better at it, but I think that's, that's something that really surprised me. I thought I would be the laissez-faire parent and my wife would be more the helicopter mom. And she's actually, she's actually, I hear, I hear the conversation. She talks to him like he's a teenager. It's wonderful. She's uh she, she really, she's like, she gives him a lot of tough love and, um and she gives him, she's a therapist. So I think she comes naturally to her, but she treats him like an adult and she gives him choices and she makes sure he knows that there's consequences to his actions. And it's wonderful. Um, But talking about, that's such an interesting question. Before I, before I talk about the tr trying to figure out the, 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 you want I don't want my kid to be a mini me. I want him to be better than me in many ways, but I also want him to find his own path. And I, I'd love to talk about that. But before we do, can we talk a little bit about why we met in in 2019? Like why you were there and um, what you got out of it? Because I think it was really fascinating. And talking about it with you, even I think a year or two later, was really impact impactful for me because when we first met I wasn't a parent and then when we talked about it a few years later I was and you shared a lot of things and it actually really helped me and I think a lot of people would get a lot out of that yeah we were there um to attend an ayahuasca ceremony with a mutual friend of ours with eight other seven other including you and I nine total um tough guys <laughs> from different realms but everyone was linked by jujitsu except for me and my buddy um we had none of that you know macho background which it was it was so interesting because you know when the medicine did take hold you could see that it kind of levels everybody off just sort of like fatherhood does but i was there because i had a long interest in the medicine and i needed a drastic change i was a year into having twins it completely changed my life uh, as it does for everyone but me. I had those kids at 40 and my impression of what it was going to be like, how I would deal personally with having children was fairly straightforward and that's not how it came to be. It had such a devastating impact on my sense of identity as a free person, as an artist. Um, I had really identified, you know, I had really calcified this idea of myself as one thing and twins will completely change that. Uh, and as a result, I felt more terrible than I'd ever felt. You know, I was ready to jump off a roof. Um, that's not really a, a euphemism. Like I was pretty in a really dark place and um, we had that ceremony and it instantly changed many, many things uh, in a very challenging format for me ayahuasca the entity was a bit of a bully during that session but as they say you know it's not necessarily what you're looking for what you want but it's precisely what you need and i needed to heal my relationship with my son um, and my family and my partner and that is what that ceremony did in a really formidable way one which you know i've said this before but for the next year no joke, I was a little bit afraid to go to sleep because if I met her in my dreams and I hadn't made the changes that she expected of me, there would be even more hell to pay. And I just didn't want to have to go through that again. It was traumatic for me. It was very, very traumatic, but you know, it was exactly what I needed to change. And since then, it's been a work in progress. Um, ultimately, that was probably planting the seeds for why I want to help other dads. Because if you've been a father in that position, feeling you what, like you want to kill yourself rather than continue on with this new version of you and how your life is, um, you know, it's good to know that other people have been there before and, and what they did to overcome that. Uh, see, when you shared that with me, I had no idea. And um, I think it's just such an important thing to share because I started off by 
saying, you know, all the blessings of fatherhood and how it's given me so much happiness. All that's true. Um, I love that expression. Being being a father is like having a beating heart, but it's outside your body. And I think that's a really wonderful description of how you feel when you're when you when your kids are around you. Um, but it it's the the I think the first year kind of sucks. It did for me. It does for a lot of men. Um, that a lot of the time during pregnancy. Um, the woman is is had that has that physical connection. She's rubbing her stomach. She's 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 there with the with the little baby growing inside her. She has that connection. Whereas us as men, it tends to take some time to get. And I know it took me a while. Um, I'll never forget when it hit me though. When I I was holding him, I think I, I was doing like some midnight feeding or something. I, I would take the night shift. I'm a night owl, so I give my wife a break and I would kind of look after him at night. And so it's probably one in the morning. And I remember holding him, and he was probably you know nine months old or something. And I just remember looking at him and I'm thinking, I would kill for you. Like, just have this crazy life. Where did this come from? You know, this this crazy, just like, I would do anything for you. But it's, it took some time. And uh, I have a good friend of mine, shout out Trevor. He's got a nine month old. And I was just with him in Mexico City at a friend's uh, wow. 50th birthday party. And we were talking and he was, he was kind of saying about some of the struggles. I mean, he already has an incredible bond with his son, which is amazing. Um, and I was telling him, you know, it took me a bit of time to get that bond. But um, we were talking and he was kind of show, sharing some of the stuff about the, the challenges. He's a real type A personality. And um, I think it's a big change for him suddenly. You know, he's incredibly orderly and professional and successful. And suddenly you have the, this chaotic um, thing with a baby and your know, schedule's thrown off and everything. And he's incredibly regimented. And it just reminded me, I was like, man, I've kind of forgotten. You're right. The first year, and I was telling him, man, the first year is really tough. You're ahead of the curve. You're already doing better than me. You have more of a connection with your son than I had at that stage. And that's a good reminder too, because it it's like it, there's certain times when you look back at your life, is there certain periods that they do have to suck. And there's this phrase in wrestling called embrace the suck. And it's like, you just got to get through it. It's the same as a training camp for a fight. The last month, I don't think anyone enjoys it. You know, your body's beat up. You're on a calorie deficient diet, most likely, because you're trying to make weight and you're trying to get to the fight, hopefully uninjured. Um, you don't want to catch a virus or something. Your your immune system's depleted. You just want to get it through and be done with it. And you just have that feeling like, I've just got to get through the next month. And I think it's not quite as extreme, but the first year as a father, I think, is kind of like that. Um, and looking back now, I'm definitely, hopefully, you know, we're trying for number two, I'm going to be a bit more... I'm going to enjoy that chaotic first year a bit more because I know that, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. Um, and I know I'm going to get through it. I don't really think a lot of that first year is fun. And if you go into it knowing that it gets much more fun, that's nice to know, to hear it from other people. So when you told me that, um, I think I was like six months in or something when we had that conversation. And it really helped me because I, I was thinking, man, I you're such a you know happy-go-lucky guy. I didn't realize that you were dealing with all this. And just as an aside, so I was like, I'll say... I can only imagine with twins how much harder it is because with one, you know, when he's asleep, he's asleep. But with twins, I'm sure like when one of them's asleep, the other one starts screaming, wakes him up. And you're like, who do I go to first? And I can only imagine. So kudos to you, man. Twins is just a whole nother level. And uh, yeah, you got through it. Thank you. Well, I mean, and the other thing is, uh, you know, in many ways, I'm kind of a control freak too. And so if, you know, my wife runs out of breast milk. Well, then we got to get donor milk. We're not just going to get old, plain old formula like you can get at the grocery store. So then, you know, there were trips to the parking lot of Capitol Records, you know, uh, clandestine. Give me the milk. Pass me the milk. Put it in the cooler. Got to get back. Um, you know, and then we were making formula for a minute. Like we were making our own formula. And, and it's just a lot of those things you know, uh, my sisters would just be like shaking their head like you fucking idiot. You made it way harder on yourself. But, you know, you're trying to do the best for your kids. It's like this is here's one interesting thing that ayahuasca uh, conveyed to me, which is is and this is actually a great mantra for all dads. Imagine if, you know, your child or your children were the most important children ever born. Now, I'm not saying they are. They probably aren't, but just imagine that they were. How differently would you treat them if you had that information? You would probably never try to steal their shine. You would probably never try to make them feel less than, you know, or unappreciated in any way. You would do things differently if that's what you truly believed. And so it's a nice way to, you know, sometimes when they're being real shits, you're just like, man, there's no fucking way this is the most important kid ever born. <laughs> However, 
Um, if you have that in the back of your mind, I think it really will change maybe some of the things that you do. A, a lot of my own personal story with the the ayahuasca transformation was because I had some, you know, like deep contempt and resentment for my kids and how it changed my life. And I would express that in said and unsaid ways around my son. And they can feel all of that. They can feel it all the time. Even if you don't think they can, or you think that sounds like some hippy dippy stuff, uh, I've seen otherwise. So uh, you have to be conscious of that and kind of going off on a tangent. But let me ask you this. Um, what has been easier than you imagined about the process? The entire fatherhood. No, no, no. Let me back up. Before I ask you that question, you're trying for number two. What are you doing differently, if anything, this time? Um, well, the tr I've just, I've done some health changes, things like Different um, supplements, dietary. Yes, exactly. I've got a few, um, a few different supplements and just, um, the uh me medical marijuana you know I, uh, I i that's my i'm a california sober guy so i don't drink alcohol but i do like some evening uh mild you know marijuana in the evening i cut all that out because i think that's not good for fertility um and i i was doing a lot of um hot yoga and things like that so that's not heat's not good um so i cut that out too and it's tough it's like it's one of those things where you never think about when you're young because well, a lot of single men are, are trying not to get pregnant sure. as they're enjoying single life. And then suddenly now I'm at that age where I'm speaking to a lot of my wife's friends and they're also trying for kids and it's taken a bit of time. And the first one took a bit of time. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it can be a little frustrating. Um, my wife actually did acupuncture the first time and got pregnant straight away. And so that she's, that's on, that's on her list of things to do, but she's been going through, we, we've been going through um, a couple of things the last few months. And I think, she's one of those people where she's very in tune with her body and it's almost like she's not quite ready to get pregnant right now because she's dealing with some things um one thing was crazy we went to a friend's we've been on a couple of mexico birthday trips but a few months ago we went for a friend's 40th birthday and she got um she got some type of infection but she got she got sick so we came back and we just thought it was getting sick from traveling so she's in bed and she's kind of tough and she's not really telling me how bad it is and then finally i think we uh we, we check her temperature and it was really high and one of our friends is like, you know, you got to take, call, sends me a message, take your wife to the ER, like this isn't good. So, so we go to the ER and we, we, yeah, we go to the ER and they say like, where have you been? You should have come days ago. You know, you've got uh, a blood infection. It's entering your kidneys. You know, you, you're starting to get sepsis. Like if you'd wait a few more di days, you're going to die. And Jesus. it was just like this shock of, I'm kind of anti, you know, I'm anti big pharma and I'm kind of anti medicine, you know, the, the whole, the, there's the, the whole approach where if you go for a, for an issue, if you have a certain issue and you go to the hospital and they're just going to give you a bunch of different drugs for the for the for the issue, but they're not going to the root cause is probably not going to be addressed. And that was always the way I saw saw um, hospitals. But of course, if you get shot or you're in a car accident, the first thing you do is you're going to rush to ER for trauma. So I, I think I was a bit too much of, of where I wasn't even thinking I should probably take it to the ER. I just thought oh, she's going to get better. She's healthy. She's 39. And she's the same way. She's kind of like, oh, you know, I'll tough it out. I'll be better. But it just goes to show that just the, the craziest thing, like a few more days of being stubborn, I could be a, a single father and a widow. It's just absolutely wild. So she went through that. She was in the hospital for nearly a week of like constant um, antibiotic IVs. They couldn't find the right IV for a few days. Um, so that was really traumatic and it was really tough um, for her, obviously. And it was also tough for me because I was juggling, you know, three dogs uh, work and, and my toddler going back and forth to the hospital. And he was actually very traumatized. And a lot of time she went to have lunch yesterday with her girlfriend and um, he was freaking out, my son, because he was like his mom in the hospital. And so he's got it, it's he's at that age where he's just three and three and a few months. And it's it imprinted so much trauma on him that he's worried now anytime his, his mom's not there. Is she in the hospital? Is she gone? So he he's very confused by the whole thing. And then just when we got back from that, um, we have a we had a 14 year old German Shepherd who when we met, he was my dog. But when we met him and my wife just kind of bonded. He was like a shadow for the last seven and a half years. He passed away. And, it, you know, we knew it was coming. It was 14, but he was really part of the family. He was like this wonderful protector and he was such a good dog. And so that that hit her really hard. So we've been kind of overcoming. Um, she's been overcoming that. And I feel like she's not quite ready with, with all this stuff going on to get pregnant. So she's one of those weird things where when she's attuned, um, I, I think it'll happen. But this is such an interesting thing. And if you're, if you never had dogs or you're not really a dog person, this might go over your head. But with my dog passing away, it, it's such a, 
I got, I got, it, it was, it, I really miss, miss him. And I was speaking to a lot of people and one of my good friends said, Lawrence, like, I cried more for when my when my dog died than when my dad died. Like the the bond that you can have with with certain certain people and certain dogs is very very strong. And what it what it gave me is it was like a trial period that I've got so much wisdom from that because there were so many times where I would come in from from the city and I'd be on an annoying work call and I would basically just switch to my AirPods as I'm getting out of the car and I'd walk in the house and he would rush to greet me with a shoe is what he always did. And and obviously it wouldn't always be like this, but sometimes I'd just be like, hey buddy. And I'm kind of like dealing with some annoying thing with the call that I would kind of brush him off and I would just kind of, and, and I remember a couple of times being like, man, that was kind of a, sh kind of almost my subconscious being like, that was kind of a shitty greeting. You know, he's been waiting for me to come home. And um, of course I knew he was going to pass away because he was 14 and he was a German shepherd mix. They don't live, that was very, you know, he has a long life. But if if I had known for sure, kind of what you said, if you know your kid's the most important kid in the world, you would do things differently. If I had known for sure, like, hey, this you've only got two more weeks with him, would I have done things differently? Yes. And so the wisdom it's given me is that we're all going to die. We don't, we don't know when, but we're all we're not going to be here forever. And there's so many times where you don't appreciate something until it's the last time you do it. So I remember I had all these different types of fighting, boxing and MMA and jiu-jitsu. And um, the last jujitsu tournament I had, I, I've, I've temporarily retired. It was about eighteen months ago, and it was. Oh Jesus! We You'll playing. be back. You'll be back. <laughs> but but Thomas, we, we were competing in California, in Dallas, and, and um, because I knew it was going to be the last one, at least for a while, I enjoyed the process so much, and luckily it went well. But for the whole process I enjoyed so much, and then the same with my with my MMA. With the, all the pro fights are like a blur of stress and anxiety, and I just wanted to get through them, except the last one, because the last one I knew it was my last one. I remember. When the music came out for the walkout for my last one, my coach is like, let's go champ. And I was like, coach, give me a second. And I was just breathing everything in from everything, from the preparation to the hand wraps, to the walk to the cage, to the announcing, to the luckily I won a decision, to, to the fight, to after the fight, to the post-fight celebrations, to the icing my, my joints after and the bruises, the whole thing I enjoyed. And I remember being so regretful that if, if I had had that same mindset, 15 years ago through all the other co competition if i had known that this was a limited thing that i'm going to i'm going to have to enjoy because after enjoying the process in, in the moment because it's going to be too late after then um i would have enjoyed it so much more and i've got that exact same approach with my son where that talking about the chaos and i'm sure you know this when i trip over his toys in the middle of the night because i'm going to pee or something you know <laughs> i'm just i'm just all like i clean up i clean up his his the, the basement and then 20 minutes later, he's tipped every single box upside down and made a complete mess. And I'm just like, oh, Jesus, why did I even bother? Like all those little micro frustrations, I I know for a fact that when he leaves home, I'm going to miss these moments so much. So I'm determined to enjoy them in the moment. And that that's a realization that I just got six months ago. And man, it has made me so much happier. It's made me so much more appreciative. Things that would have bothered me before don't bother me. And even even things that would irritate me before almost bring me happiness because I know I'm going to miss them in the future. And I just, man, Thomas, I wish I'd had that mindset when I was younger because I would have just been so much happier in my life. Oh, that's such a great, uh, great piece of advice. And I and I can completely validate that myself. I, I almost had a this is about three months ago, but, you know, you'll get this more as your son starts to like grow out of clothes and stuff and you'll just see a tiny little shoe that will almost bring you to tears because you know that that little chapter is closing. And I think if there's anything I could share about that first year, you know, as a piece of advice to young fathers, it is, they say that, you know, the time moves really fast. Well, in the first year it doesn't, it moves really slowly. At least it did for me, especially with two, it was interminable. Um, but what I didn't do is appreciate because I was so uncomfortable, because it was so difficult, I didn't appreciate all those moments. In fact, a lot of it's like out of my out of my head at all. I can't remember it. And that's where people should take your advice and and try to, you know, yes, it's hard, but embrace that suck, you know, and go, this is cool because it's fleeting, it's ephemeral. I won't always feel this way. And I won't always have the opportunity to pick up these tiny little blocks because then it's going to be, you know, bigger blocks or bigger, whatever the toy will be. And then maybe cigarette butts and you know, who fucking knows. But for now, it's like you have these special little moments. And unless you're really present, uh, they'll be gone, you know.
and and I've really been thinking um, with just the idea of just being more present in life in general is something that society has made it so hard. We are we are bombarded with so many messages constantly, whether it's emails, texts, calls, whether it's commercials, whether it's flashing screens, whether you, know, you can't be on a plane without a screen being in front of me. Wherever you are, you're at an airport, there's a hundred screens. Like everywhere around us is just it's incoming stimulus. And one of my one of my big goals is just to is just to work on on just peace and and getting away from that. And it's it's taking I used to I, I still love listening to audiobooks and podcasts and things, but I'll go for runs now or, or walks where I would have maybe listened to something and got more stimulus and I'll just either listen to music or take nothing and just listen to nature <laughs> because you have to give yourself time to be more present and just step back. And it's it's a constant juggle with my work. And and you, 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 you if you're a high achiever and you have big goals and big dreams, part of you is trying to maximize your life. So you're trying to pack it with as much good things and, and productivity things as you can. But at the end of the day, when you, I always think like that, that lovely book, uh, Five Regrets of the Dying, when you when you talk to people at the end of their life, like what do they really care about? And again, it's kind of the, that was the the message that I got with, with my dog when he passed away. It was man, there were so many times where um, I would tell him the last like six months. I knew I knew he didn't have long. I would tell him every night uh, when I went to bed. I said, "You're such a good boy. Your work is done. Like you you just enjoy the country now. We moved out of the city. You, you your job is done as a guard dog. You know, he, he just enjoy life. Like you've been a great great dog." I'd always turn that because I knew I didn't want him to pass away. And I wish I told him he was such a good dog. So I did do it a little bit. Of course, you in hindsight, which I've done it a bit more. But um, it's it's that realization that everything that we love doing, there's going to be a time, the last time we do it, and we don't know when that is. And you can't wait for that to appreciate it. So I'm trying to just, because there's, there's so many times I, I go to jujitsu and I'm parking my car and my low back hurts and I didn't sleep great last night and I have a bunch of work stress on my mind and I'm panic grumpy. And I'm like, man, I could just put my seat back and take a 90 minute nap right now instead of going to class. I really don't want to go. But I was, I always do and I always warm up and I always have a great time and I have the camaraderie and I have, I always, I always leave feeling, you know, 10 times better. But I, I try and think about that too. Like there'll be a day where, you know, I, maybe I can't train anymore. I don't want to train or my body's too broken or, you know, every single thing that I enjoy doing, there'll be a, there'll be a day where, where you, you know, you won't do that anymore. And I think I have, you know, every marriage has its challenges. Um, I think I, I lucked out with the compatibility with my wife and I nearly lost her a few months ago. And this is, I've been thinking a lot about that too. It's like, man, like you just don't think about these things. You know, she's a healthy 39 year old. I'm, I'm a healthy 44 year old. You don't think, but man, like things happen. You know, you never know. You, you know, we, we could just, good news tends to take a lot, lot of time and effort, good things to happen. And bad news just happens. You know, you go in for a regular checkup and suddenly, you know, the doctor could find something and, and suddenly you only have a few years left of your life, you know, maybe a few months. We never know when that can happen. So I'm just trying to, I don't want to be pessimistic. I think I'm an optimistic person like you, but Jesus, Thomas, like we've got to, we've got to be more appreciative because I know for me speaking personally, I let way too much um, noise and, and silly stuff that doesn't matter in the big picture of life irritate me. And that's same. what I'm really trying to stop. Yeah, same. And and as as an, another way to illustrate that point, those changes happen in an instant. And I hadn't really had to deal with injuries uh, so much with my children until last summer. Um, we were in rural Panama on this really nice coral reef that was well preserved. And Seneca fell from a nine foot ladder and you know busted his chin open. And the closest hospital is, you know, a 35 minute panga boat away. And then we get all that sorted. Like this isn't the time to go into that story. But then, you know, a couple of weeks later, we're in the backyard and Isla is playing, my daughter is playing soccer and she trips over a tree root, you know, and it, it completely breaks and dislocates her elbow. Like we had just sat down, poured a little drink on a Friday evening. Ah, it's the weekend. <laughs> a broken arm and like you know i i've shortened my hair but like my chin is bright white i think i must have aged 10 years last summer just because of what that devastating change does to you, you jump into action you're so terrified that some you know seneca's fall was such that it's like is his jaw broken has he fractured yeah. bones in his face he had actually fractured two molars all the way down to the nerve and had to get them replaced. But in order to, you know, fix that, you got to go to the orthopedic surgeon and give them an MRI. They can't drill until they've made sure that no bones are broken. It's just, 
you know, it happens so fast. So while things are good and while things are calm, man, fucking soak that up. Um, what has well, been Thomas, Lawrence? That, so sorry. Before, can, you, can you talk a little bit about, I remember when we were, I think we were either texting or we had a real brief conversation right after, but when your daughter broke her arm, it, it was like hours till you could, till you could get seen. And she was like in and out from screaming to calm. And I was thinking about it after we spoke and I'm thinking, I, I haven't been through anything like that with my son, luckily, but like just the, that's just, just crazy. Like just how you deal with that as a parent. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? I know it was a bit traumatic, but. Yeah. I mean, it's just, um, you can't imagine how much seeing them in pain will affect you. I mean, you can just theoretically you go, well, I'd never want to see my child, you know, scream out in pain. But then when it's things beyond your control, like you are in the UCLA emergency room and you can't make anything happen faster. Like it's, You've done everything that you can and it's still not enough. And your child saying, why can't they, you know, fix my broken arm? I mean, her elbow is like over here, right? It was, it was just, and all she had was, was Tylenol and Motrin alternated to, to keep the pain down or at bay. And so it, it's just, it's a feeling of helplessness that is hard. That's pretty singular. You know, it's, it's hard to find anything else that's, that's comparable because, you've done all you can in that moment. Now it's up to somebody who's, <laughs> I have to tell you, I, maybe I told you this, but I was carrying her out to the car from the backyard. And I did have that moment, Lawrence, where her elbow's here. And I was like, I could be a fucking hero right now. All I got to do is just jam that elbow right back into place. And then I'll, I'll have saved the day. And thankfully I didn't do that because it was completely attached and, and just uh, to, detached and the humerus was was a little bit broken but um you do think like how can i make this better instantly my you know my this child from my loins is crying out in pain i can't do anything she's asking me to fix her and um it's devastating when you can't do anything so thankfully the good folks at the children's hospital you know at ucla put humpty dumpty back together and she you know put those pins in her arm and you know kids they're only four weeks in a cast and all of a sudden just right as rain. There was a little bit of atrophy in her left arm, um, but she took her, you know, like kindergarten photo with this big pink cast on, which she was <laughs> brutalized by. She was so appalled. She was like, well, I want to retake the picture and I want that cast on, which is, you know, then it became a vanity thing less than my arm doesn't work. Um, but yeah, it's, and same with Seneca. Like we could see how deep, the the wound was and he's crying out and he said something really far out lawrence he's like are my teeth still my teeth feel different is my are my teeth still in my mouth he felt like my mouth is different you know and he can feel the intense change right all we see is you know the, okay we see some blood and we know that there's this large um wound under his chin that looks pretty grave it's pretty deep it's going to require five stitches but internally, he could feel like he had chipped off teeth. The, they were impacted so much from the fall, you know, they were shattered. Um, really going off track here. But like the, the, the injury with your children is something you cannot prepare for. And hopefully you react in the best possible way. Uh, afterwards, you're going to feel like you need a, a drink and a cigarette, even if that's not what you're into. <laughs> because it will rattle you to your core. And then, uh, this is the last thing I'll say on it, they will continue to bring it up and try to work their way through the the trauma of it and the aftermath until they have gotten to a a safe place in their mind, you know, as, as for therapy, you know, it's just like, I know Seneca was dreaming for a while about that fall. It didn't deter him from getting on stuff. It didn't make him gun shy at all. It just, he would talk about it like, it was just so scary, you know, so scary. And getting over the fear of of how it changes them and the adrenaline shooting through their body and knowing that something, I, I don't think they have probably the, the wherewithal to say, I almost, you know, died or my arm was almost made unusable by this action. But they do know that it was, probably one of the most powerful 
physiological things that has happened to them, which shot a certain feeling through their body of panic, fear, terror, whatever. Um, it's power, you know? Everyone's got to go through it. Way, that's, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, kids learn so much by pushing their limits and, you know, running as fast as they can until they trip and fall. I mean, it, it is inevitable, isn't it? Like, like I'm just thinking, if I'm asking you advice, I've got to run by just three-year-old. And, um, you know, he runs into things and trips and falls and he's just, he's just wild, right? So much energy that is, isn't that part of their development though, is just letting them, it's, it's just trying to make sure it's not as devastating as they can't come back from it. Like you said, you know, it was close, you know, luckily that her arm works and his jaw is okay now, but, um, it's trying to find that balance between letting them learn by hurting themselves, but not letting them hurt themselves, um, irrecoverably, irre irre you know? Well, yeah, but I mean, look, just like you. You know, I've told you this before, like we have, you know, climbing holds on the trees. We built a, a playground in the backyard, which has more things. Very, It was always very important to me that the kids had, you know, um, pulling strength early uh, so that they could hold themselves up and, and save themselves to avoid a fall. <sighs> Seneca's absolute strength is, is really high, um, or is it relative strength? Yeah, I guess his relative strength, but his ability, Perfect. you know, he could probably do a dead, dead hang for a long time. He just slipped, man. Like he got to the top, reached for the last rung and missed it and just nine feet down. But what was interesting is he like, didn't put out his hands at all. Like no hands, just right on his chin, you know, which is peculiar, but that's how it went down. And I had done everything I could to prepare them to be strong and, um, agile and balanced and capable. It was just a freak thing. And then same with Isla, like she just tripped and the way that she fell, her hand hit like a, the other tree root in a weird way that just snapped her arm. I mean, it's, it's a freak thing. You got to be lucky like Tony Hawk, evidently who didn't break any bones, you know, even though he was doing all the extreme moves or so just crazy. be ready to, you know, deal with it. I will say this public service announcement if you're in the Los Angeles area and your kid snaps their arm at 5 p.m. on a Friday, don't go to the closest emergency room. Go to the Children's Orthopedic Hospital um, and UCLA because otherwise you will end up there anyway and it will just be more hours before your kid gets care. Um, that's one question, thing, there, Lawrence. But, but Thomas, that's one wonderful thing is that I feel like when things are calm, like I should know exactly where to take him in, in, a, in an emergency because like you said, I don't know. We just, we moved recently. I, it's probably not the ER. It's probably the children's hospital, right? The children's ER. So I, that stuff, it's stuff you don't think about, but when things are good, but that stuff I should have in my phone, you know, emergency vet for the dogs, emergency, you know, thing for me, where's the nearest place I go if I'm by myself and I have an accident, you know, bad accident, uh, where 100%. am I going to take my son? So just be, being prepared. It's like that there's, I'm, I feel like you and I are both very similar in the fact that we're optimistic. We, we know there's a lot of challenges to humanity in the world and, uh, you know, the years going forward, but we try and, you know, we don't let it paralyze us in life. We try and stay optimistic, but at the same time, being prepared for things, I think is important too. Yeah, well, you don't want to learn that lesson the hard way like we did. You know, it just it wasted an additional three hours of mm -hmm. being shuttled back and forth and waiting and then being told ultimately, no, we can't treat you here, which, you know, was just over time harder on harder on my daughter. Um, mm -hmm. But back to my original question, what about this whole fatherhood thing has been harder than you imagined? You again, you're you're highly accomplished. You're supremely disciplined. And yet what? for you has still been like, God damn, this is, this is really fucking hard. But like there's never enough time in the day and just time management is, is so hard. There's always, there's always, um, things that I I'm trying to do and I've just, it, I've got to be better about leap, just dropping everything when I want to be with him. And I actually just heard something wonderful. It said, um, for people that entrepreneurs and things, people that have a bit more flexibility where you have a lot of work to do, but it doesn't have to be done this second. It can be done either now or in three hours, you know, those kind of, those kind of um, positions and work, work titles. If there's certain periods that are really important. So now there's, there's a period where if I was in the city for five hours doing jujitsu and doing work, and then I come home and I'm with him, drop everything. Everyone can wait an hour. 
go to the park with him and, and my dogs and just be present with him and then come back to it. Or like if it's in the morning before I leave and I have a little window with him, just really be present. And that that that's the biggest challenge is because I'm always, I'm one of those people where I like to do, I remember reading a productivity book, I think it was by David Allen. And he said, if something takes less than two minutes, you should do it straight away. And if it's more than two minutes, uh, rank it in order of importance and get back to it later. And nice. that's something that I do a lot in real estate. In real estate, you have so many things that take less than two minutes. You know, schedule a quick showing might be about a minute and a half on showing time. To get back to someone by text might be 45 seconds. You know, a lot of, a lot of these little tiny things, texting someone, hey, I'm on the other line, I'll call you right back. And But when there's 20 of those two-minute things, suddenly that's 45 minutes, and you told your son, give me five minutes, and it's 45 minutes later, and he's looking at you like, well, you know, do you two words not mean anything? So I think that's been the biggest challenge is just – is is the – Life is so, it's so ironic, um, Thomas. It's like when our kids are grown and they leave, most likely we're going to be at a stage in our professional lives where we're going to be working less. So, and we're going to be financially much better off than we are today. So the time that we're trying to maximize our professional life is also the time when our kids are there and we want to give them as much time as, as we can. And it's just, it's, it's so ironic. And then you have all these people at the end of their life where they just have more time than they, 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 they can do with, and they're kind of lonely and bored. And it's just, it's such a, it's like the paradox of life. It's like you, you, you have the most demands on your time all at the same time. And so that for me is definitely the biggest challenge. It's a great, great point. I feel super, super lucky that, you know, COVID happened when it did because my kids were only, you know, a year and a half old at the time. And because I spent so much time at home, I feel like I really, you know, I'd got the lesson from ayahuasca. So I was like, all right, well, it's time to change. And, you know, we got to do really cool stuff in terms of, of family unit time. We built garden beds together. That's something that I'm going to do a separate thing on. Like, I, I think everybody should have a garden and uh, especially for kids, because it, it connects them to their food source and what real food is and where it comes from, which is, you know, completely different when you walk into a grocery store and see everything in little packages or wrapped in cellophane. It's like you don't you don't have any idea where that shit comes from. Um, and And just being able to spend all those hours when I know that my father, for example, never got to do that because of his job and, and the obligations that he had. And most, most dads, to be fair, right? COVID hopefully gave everybody the time to be a lot closer to their family unit for more time and made people go, wow, this is the best. We should do this more often, not have a pandemic, but spend more quality time with the family, you know, in this way and, and dedicate time to being together because it's healing in so many ways. Um, well, I, I agree with time management though. Oof, that's tough. Well, Thomas, since, since I've known you, I feel like you and I have both had, um, we're kind of entrepreneurs, you know, more flexible schedules. We both work hard, but it's a bit more flexibility, but there's no, there's most entrepreneurs. If you look at the statistics work harder than people that have jobs, right? We, we tend to, um, do more, more late nights, more weekends and, um, early mornings, shout out early mornings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm a night owl. So I'm, I'm a night, you're, you're early mornings, but there, there's no point in taking all the extra risk of being an entrepreneur and working longer. If you don't enjoy the one thing you have, and that one thing you have is flexibility. And that's when you drop everything and you say, I'll get back to it in 90 minutes. Cause the sun just came out and I'm going to run to the park real quick. Cause my son just woke up from his nap, you know? So that's something that I'm really trying to do better of is, um, I think last summer was the best summer that I had in my life. And it's because I did two things more than I've done before. One of them was my friend has, is building a, a lake house on the Lake Michigan on the, the Indiana side. And it's not that close to me. It's still 45 minutes to an hour to get there, but he has a real nice little private beach and we were going up there with my son and a group of friends were just hanging out on the beach with him. And then I was also doing, um, my, my friend has a boat and my wife and I would, we'd go babysitter and we would just have us time, you know, her and I on the boat enjoying the weather. And it gave me it, such a, it's, it's a funny thing because in England, um, there's like a joke. The first thing you always say when you meet people is, is you say something about the weather. Like that's the, the traditional English greeting is like, oh, hi, look. Isn't it, isn't it windy today? You know, that's, it's always the weather, but weather can, I don't know if you've ever, <laughs> ever had a vacation with bad weather, but man, weather can make, make or break a vacation. 
it can and it just it it does impact everything with kids and i think that's something that there's a lovely book and i think it's called something like um 18 summers or something like that and it talks about when when your kids are in school that the only time you really have the long time to connect with them is during the summer holidays and he's not in school yet but i have that same mentality where um i'm really going to prioritize the summers because that was the first time where i felt like work was kind of slow with the interest rates going up in real estate kind of slowed down in the summer. So I wasn't working as much as I normally would. And I really took the time to enjoy the, this last summer, 2023. And I'm determined now to make that the priority of summers. And it, I know, of course, I have to be willing to upset some people, not be as available, lose some business. Uh, I, I can accept all of that because I'm not going to take all the um, the, the risks and, and challenges and hard work of being an entrepreneur and not enjoying the benefits. And so that's, that's one of my priorities is really enjoying the good temperature with kids when it's nice you, you're a bit different because you live in california so i'm sure you have a lot more say, nicer days. doesn't it shouldn't you just move to a place with better weather and then you <laughs> don't have to wait for the summer <laughs> well i will say okay i love i moved to a house i moved to a place in a country just like what you said having a garden i really I, we have eight acres it's wild forest behind the house and i see deer outside the window it's just wonderful and i love that he's outside the city of chicago i used to live in, in a high-rise downtown and I love the fact that he has that. And one thing I love about this particular house is it has this lovely, long, windy driveway to the house. And I was like, oh, I just love that. And then a couple of months ago when it was freezing cold and I was out on that long, windy driveway with some salt, salt in the driveway, <laughs> and it was freezing cold and I was slipping and sliding on the ice. I remember thinking, hmm, maybe I got some things wrong in life that I should just move to Hawaii. What's going on? But the one thing I'll say, Thomas, is I like the idea of him getting the adversity from the tough winter seasons. Yes. And I'm going to I'm, I'm gonna have him. I want to link. One thing that I think my dad did a really good job with me was financially. And my dad always, he had a weird approach to money. For him, he linked money and time, which I linked to. Like, I, I want to use money to buy back my freedom. But my dad would always say, he was a pilot and he said, I'll always work the minimum amount of hours that I need to. And I'll use that free time to do things like, you know, I'll mow the lawn and I'll do stuff in the yard and everything. He's like, some of my friends, they'll work the maximum amount of hours and they wait, make way more money than me. But then they're paying for a, someone to do their yard work and they're paying for babysitters for the kids. And they're just they're not really living their life. They're just making all this money and their life is flying by. And I think my that's something that I've come to appreciate with my dad is. You, you can keep being more productive and you can make more money and you can keep outsourcing things. But like some of my fondest childhood memories are when I was helping my dad, like I'd mow the lawn and he was doing something in the backyard with me and it was the sun was out. And that's some of my favorite childhood memories. So it's not always about making more money and outsourcing things. It's about just enjoying time more. Um, and so, so one thing that my dad did really well with me is he always he always gave me money to help him with like things like yard work from a young age. So I associated work with wealth. I associated sacrificing now for the benefits later. And I think that's one thing that I really want to do with my son is when it's cold, you know, Hey, help me, um, you know, uh, salt the driveway or help me clean up the backyard. And, and we're going to chop down a bunch of trees and cut up a bunch of, make a bunch of firewood. And we're going to do these things where I can give him hard manual work and it, it can be a bonding experience and and he can make a little bit money too so i think that's um that's something that i really like about the the hardships of living in a place like the midwest is he's going to have plenty of he's going to get plenty of resilience from being out there in the minus temperatures slipping on slipping on ice on the driveway plus you know with eight acres you can really instill a sense of obligation around land stewardship which you could never give to your son in the city you know i mean it would be like who look isn't it nice that there's this park uh, amongst all these you know concrete and, and skyscrapers but in the country every day is like you know we're planting new trees we are cutting down old ones we're planting gardens we're interacting with nature how has that changed um your daily sense of well-being in your family is has that been palpable for you guys Almost, it's been the best thing. I have so many people that will see me at the gym or something, and they're like, "Hey, how are you finding Indiana? Are you happy there?" And I cannot stress the only thing I was worried about. I was worried about the commute, but I I need to make a lot of work calls anyway. So I basically my commute is my moving office, or I just listen to podcasts or music, and it's really not that bad. It's actually a decompression time. But the the difference that I have from when I used to come home in the city of Chicago, where there was just so much crime around, and there was so many high, so much high taxes. 
And I felt like I wasn't getting the benefit of the taxes. I felt like they were mismanaging the city so much. I had this like annoyance and bitterness that just never left me. And I feel like they keep voting for worse and worse leadership in Chicago. And it's so frustrating because I love the people there. And I just, I think I found the perfect solution. I've moved to a state that's way more libertarian and I come home and it's just, it's night and day. Like I, I come home and I just feel like so the the weight of of my of my life is is left in Chicago. The weight of my career is left in the city, and I'm in the countryside. And it's just to hear birds outside and just mow the, mow the lawn and walk in the backyard and see like where I'm recording recording right now. I'm looking out at the back of my um my ravine out, out in the back, and it's just wildness. And I'll see you know four or five deer just wandering around there. It's just it feels so calming and you're so much more connected to nature and i just i just don't think it's natural for humans to be have millions of people stacked on in a, in a couple of square miles on top of each other i just don't yeah, I mean, think that's a natural way to live i think it's great when you're when you're young when you're young you have the the ability to meet so many people and to do all these things but as you get older when you start talking about raising kids i think getting out in that environment is so important you left at an early enough age for your son where maybe it wasn't hugely noticeable to him but you know over time that's going to be really palpable i think it's something that we talk about all the time because we live in you know los angeles which is is a huge sprawl but we have a backyard we're lucky enough to have a backyard with a lawn you know where we've planted our gardens etc but before when we we're in venice beach you know there was no real yard to speak of and it's like how are we gonna raise these kids in this and look, it's it's not everybody's fortunate enough to have the nature around them, especially if you're in an urban environment. But I think that is something that over time will be proven that human beings need that connection. To, well, I guess it already is, especially kids. That connection to nature is is so so important to their well being and how they grow up and their relationship to their environment at large. And if you're, you know, if you're in a place that's so urban, at least be learning about it and trying to expose them on the weekends or going to parks and stuff. Well, um, well, Thomas, I know, I don't know when, when you leave LA, like I, I've noticed when I was living in Chicago, I wouldn't, I would try when I took vacations or something, like I'd have friends that would go to like, Hey, I went to Singapore for a long weekend and it was awesome. Or I went to Hong Kong or they, they'd go from city to city. And for me, when I was living in the city, I had I had so little interest in, I might maybe fly into another city. The first thing I want to do is get the hell out of the city. <laughs> and I always found that if I could, if I could go somewhere in nature, I found it so rejuvenating. And I know that there's all the, the biological benefits of what I, I love the, the cold plunge. And in the summer, it's amazing where I'm in the cold plunge and then I go outside and I'm walking barefoot on grass and I take my shirt off and I'm getting the, the warmth from the sun. And you're just you're getting all the the, the natural benefits of that, uh, the, the biological benefits. And he's out there playing barefoot on the grass. He's, you know, getting connecting with the earth, like all the grounding, all that kind of stuff you can get. It's just it's so, so wonderful. So um, you're, so you, you have that. I mean, you have wonderful weather in L.A. You have your your backyard. You're sure you're walking barefoot all the time. So and we get the lot, ocean. You know, yeah, I mean, we got yes, the ocean yes. and we've got the mountains. I think we're quite lucky in, in Los Angeles. We can go hiking every weekend to a new spot and just really, you know, immerse ourselves in that. But if anyone needs, a, you know, any indication, watch a kid at the beach. Watch the unbridled joy that a child has when they step into the sand and play in the waves. It's different from any other time. It's different from taking them to the park and the playground. Yeah, they're going to play, but like, they go batshit crazy at the beach. And I think if you can have a kid in that environment more often than not, it will probably, you know, go a long way to, to healing whatever issues there are with being in a small space and having screens around and, you know, this confined environment. Um, I want to be conscious of the time, Lawrence, and there's still a lot of stuff I want to ask you. Uh, okay. You mentioned that you've, you know, you've been a professional fighter. I know, and we'll make sure the audience knows you've, you're a very high level jujitsu practitioner. I've been meaning to ask you, um, how will martial arts factor into your role as a father? And what has carried over from jujitsu that has helped you be a better dad, you think, compared to the dads, you know, who, who don't train <laughs> like me, for example, well, just kidding. Well, Thomas, I'll say this. Um, one of the reasons the impetus, it's going back to that same um that same uh Kikigard quote about you only understand your life when you look back. 
looking back, I'm so happy I trusted. I've, I've made a lot of good decisions in my life and I made a lot of bad decisions in my life. And one of the best decisions I made was trusting a good friend of mine who actually found this house. So I was on the sofa. It was midnight or one in the morning. I was doing some late night work. I've probably taken it while I was all high, very relaxed. I'm just doing some mindless emails and property searches. My wife's asleep. And I get a text from my good friend who's an ER doctor. And he's actually my neighbor on this street. And he sends me a, pro a link, a Zillow link to a property in Indiana. I'm not even looking in Indiana because at the time I didn't have my Indiana license. I would look at houses in different suburbs of Illinois and I'm, we're trying to decide where's our next step going to be uh, to leave the city. And um, he sends me this link and I was like, haha, you know, very funny. And he says, Lawrence, this is the perfect place to raise your family. And I said, I said, brother, like, I'm not really like financially ready to put an offer in right now. And, you know, I, I thought he was joking and he, he sent me, he was at work. So he's late. He's at work. He had some time. He probably sent me 20 messages and he said, or he basically sold me this house. So I hadn't even seen it yet. It it had, I love the fact that he was down the street, but he said something that really was made the decision going back to jujitsu. The, his other friend lives on the street and this guy, I knew of him. I'd seen him in tournaments. He's a um, jujitsu instructor. He has uh, two kids. One of his oldest at the time, I think was um, 12, 13. He's like a kid's champion. He would go out to California, compete in the kids Pan Ams. He was really, really good. And this guy was an old school black belt, you know, like fifth degree black belt. He's been teaching a long time. One of the, one of the pioneers in the Midwest jujitsu scene. And he said, imagine raising your son where your next door neighbor has a jujitsu school and his kids are jujitsu champions and he's going to have that mentorship. And I thought that's a really good point. And I like this guy. I didn't know him, but I liked him. And since I've moved, it's been a year and a half. He's so, I've become so close to him. Shout out to my buddy Braulio and shout out to Eric, my doctor friend who found my house. But Braulio has this jujitsu school. And I still, I work a lot in the city and a lot of time I train at noon. So I'm still training at my Chicago school, but I'll go to his school when I can. And he has this incredible kids program. And I'm so excited to get my son into jujitsu. And um, so the the lessons that he's going to get from it, it's if you're, if you live a lot of very, a lot of wonderful people that I really enjoy that I, whether I know them personally or whether I follow them, um, you know, their, their career or their, their personal role models to me is because they grew up in incredibly harsh upbringings and it developed so much character. Whereas you and I have worked really hard to try to give our kids a nice upbringing. So in order for them to still develop character, I think the best way is through some type of sport. And I think jujitsu is the perfect vehicle because they can start young they're not getting the the kind of contact you're getting from boxing or you know football or even even soccer. You're getting head trauma now from from heading the ball. So um, I think it's a really good way they can get resilience. And the side benefit is that they can actually protect themselves. They they're going to know balance and 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 grip fighting and body positioning and chokes and they're going to be able to protect themselves if they get get attacked. You know as they get older. But that's just the side benefit. So having having that for him is going to be invaluable. And I think for me that jujitsu is such a funny thing because. I've been training now over 20 years and the uh, the the reason that I've been going to the to the mats to train has changed like four or five times in that period because initially I hated jiu jitsu and I was a boxer who wanted to fight MMA one day so I had to learn jiu jitsu for defense like I didn't want to get taken down and strangled and that was it then as I got better by my last MMA fight I remember I took the guy down and I won with jiu jitsu because I'm thinking I was 35 and I'm like why am I going to get Hit in the hit in the face with four ounce gloves when I could just make it easy with my jiu-jitsu. So my jiu-jitsu went from defensive surviving to actually winning MMA fights. Then when I retired from MMA, I was still competing in jiu-jitsu. So it became a, a, a athletic competitive goal. Whereas now when I go to the mats, whether I compete again or not, it's the the reasons are completely different. For, for the longest time, it was also for a physical workout. I wanted the, the physical benefits. That was another reason. But now when I go, it's for it's for the camaraderie and it's for an hour and a half break from my life. And it's time to see my buddies. And a lot of the guys I train with, they're old school guys that have been training a long time. A lot of them are also fathers. A lot of them are also entrepreneurs that have flexible schedules because a lot of time I train at noon. And we just, we have so much, we're so similar, but we're all so busy. It's not like we hang out, we can hang out and get dinner and get drinks and it, the, our only social time, a lot of them is, is you know, very occasionally I might see them at a jiu-jitsu party or something. But in general, the only time I get with them is when we're actually training and it's little bits of conversation here and there after class when you're changing and sharing. But it's it's that kind of camaraderie. And it's just it just it enriches my soul so much. And I think I, I'm so lucky in the sense that one thing that people talk about is a lot of um, 
people as they get older, they just have less and less male friendships, especially men, right? Women tend to be a bit better about nurturing relationships and keeping friendships. And a lot of men get tied up in their career. And I know friends that, um, you know, they have one or two friends they barely see, especially some of my friends back home in, in London, barely see any friends. Their social so, so, social circle is so small. And I think I've been so blessed with with having so many good friendships. And one reason I love I love podcasting is you get to connect with people like you and I, you know, we, we, we have... Every now and again, we can have a really nice conversation when we're both in the car for an hour or something, but we don't talk as much as I'd like to. And But it's because we're both juggling so much. And that's one thing that the I think I'm so blessed, and I think largely through jiu-jitsu. And again, we connected through Nick. Shout out to Nick Regoretti's. He connected us. Again, I know him through jiu-jitsu. So jiu-jitsu has just given me this incredible, rich social network ranging from I've got friends in in Africa. I've got friends in Europe. I've got friends in South America. I've got a friend in New Zealand who has a school. Like I have friends all over the country in America. I have friends all over the world through jiu-jitsu. And yeah, I don't talk to them every day, but I know if I drop into the gym, we can have a wonderful training session and, and we feel like kindred souls. So um, I think in terms of um, you're, you're an incredibly um, artistic, creative person. And I think so we have to all find something that lights our fire. And so if you don't have something that's directly correlated with your job, if you work a job that you don't particularly like, but you need to do it for your health insurance, for your family, and you're kind of stuck, then try to at least find something that, that enriches and nourishes your soul. And I think for many people, jujitsu can be that vehicle. You just have to make sure you're training with the right people. So I'm not training with the same people that I would have trained with when I was 32 and I was training for a professional fight. I'm, I'm training with people that are just trying to get a break in their lunch hour from their day-to-day -day life, you know. Uh, occasionally, you know, I'll train with someone that's competing next week for a tournament, and maybe we're, we're, I'm, I'm fighting for my life because I'm not really, I'm not training right now for a tournament. I'm not trying to kill myself. I'm just trying to enjoy that environment. So I'll say, for anyone looking to get into jujitsu, there's a big difference between two ju different jujitsu schools. Find a school with a vibe and a student base that is on the same page as you. If you're a 25 year old wrestler who wants to get into competitive jujitsu, that's going to be a competitive school. If you're a 45-year-old dad who's looking to lose 20 pounds and, and find some camaraderie and happiness in his life, try to find a school with that kind of vibe or, or classes with those kind of people in it. Amazing. So so all that being said, what happens if your son is like, man, fuck jujitsu? <laughs> Great question. So um, there's, certain, there's certain things where I don't want him to be a carbon, carbon copy of me. And one of my biggest pet peeves is when I was a competitor and I'd be at these jujitsu tournaments and I would see this you know, obese parents screaming at their 12 year old because he didn't finish the choke and he got beaten by some other kid. And I'd always be disgusted by that. I live vicariously through myself for many decades and I'm not trying to live vicariously through a sports team. I'm not trying to live vicariously through my son. I've done what I've done and I'm happy with what I achieved and I'm happy that I pushed myself as far as I could. So with my son, I don't want to push him. If he's incredibly, and he is my, my wife's a great, a really good singer. She actually offered to be a professional musician in the Philippines and she, she didn't want the, um, the fame and she's, she's not into that kind of life. So she turned it down, but my, my son has some musical gifts from her. And so if he really wanted to follow a music career, I would be all about that. I want him to find his path. But having said that there's certain non-negotiables. If he's my son, he's going to get a jujitsu black belt. And the reason for that is <laughs> it's as, as my as my neighbor as my neighbor Braulio says, I said Braulio, like, what do I do if if Vic is not really into jujitsu? And he said, well, he's not really going to have a choice because that's what you do, and that's what I tell my boys. That's what we do. And Braulio's wife also just got her black belt. She's a competitor. She's going out to the Pan Ams to compete. So, you know, so husband and wife black belt, two boys, both kids champions. It's just what they do. Now he can do other things as well. He can find his other interests, but that's a superpower that I want to give him. I want to give him a black belt because I know. It's going to open up so many doors for him later on in life. It's going to give him confidence with his with himself that he can protect himself. But most importantly, what what we want for our kids is we want the respect of their peers, and it's going to give him the respect of his peers. And I think that's going to open up an infinite amount of doors because it has for me. Huh. That's that. So what what is supposed to be? So I enrolled my kids in jujitsu. I think when they were uh, three and a half, maybe four. And the school was really great. Unfortunately, it ended up burning down because it was next to a feline motel. I'm pretty positive those cats burned down the jujitsu studio. No proof. Jesus. Um, but, you know, once the studio burned down, it was an excuse not to go and not find another one. And by then, you know, Seneca's really, really into soccer and Isla's, you know, moving on into dance. I would love for them to get back into it. What does your neighbor... Uh, who's raised two champion boys 
think is the appropriate age to get started in jujitsu? So he said anywhere um, after, I think it was because Victor's three and a bit. I think he said four to five is the earliest. But the key, the key when you when I watch him teach kids, it's wonderful. And his son, who's just, I think he just turned 14 or 15, he started taking over now the kids, the kids competition class, which is wonderful. All these kids getting ready for these kids' tournaments. I love seeing because I see I see him like motivating them and it's just wonderful to see. Um, so it's it's really when they when they have enough concentration, but a good, a good, a good teacher in general is not the same as a good practitioner. You can be a world champion in jiu-jitsu and your, your teaching can suck. Um and a good kids teacher is a unique thing versus a good regular teacher. I don't think I'd be a very good kids teacher, um, but my neighbor Brado is an amazing kids teacher. He's very, very, he's got the perfect balance between being stern and being kind and motivational. And that's a really, really tough thing to do with kids. He's wonderful with kids. So I think with, with them, they're both old enough. It's a case of just um, finding a, um, a school with a good vibe and kids that you want your kids to be around. But the, the hardest thing for kids is, is I look at myself, my dad really wanted me to be a good swimmer because he couldn't learn to, he didn't learn to swim until he was an adult. And he would have nightmares when I was young that I would fall into murky water. He would dive in to find me. He couldn't find me and I would drown. He would have this nightmare. So he got my brother and I into swimming and we became competitive swimmers when I was young. That was my first sport. And I remember when I would go, I, I these, these are some of my earliest memories, actually. I remember being kicking and screaming, like, I don't want to go, dad. I don't want to go. And he was just like, well, we're going. And then on the way home, he said, I'd be so happy. I'd be like singing songs in the car, you know, because I just, I, had, I loved, I loved when I was there. I loved it. And kids need to do things that are physical because we have all that energy. But I, I had that natural whiny attitude of a kid. Like, I don't want to go. My son does it to me all the time. Do you want to go outside and walk the dogs? No, no. They say their favorite word is no, right? When they're young. So it's, it's, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge with them with jujitsu is, is I know the benefits that it's going to give them, but you know, there's going to be times and I'm not going to be a, I'm not going to be an overwhelming dad, you know, as they get older, if they're like, Hey dad, I don't feel great. Can we skip practice today? Of course. Yeah. But it's just going to be something that I want to build into the fabric of their life. And hopefully my, my son sees me getting the cold plunge every day. He sees me when I work out in my basement gym, he comes and hangs out with me down there. He's got a playroom down there. So I think I just want them to see it. It's not, it's not, it's just, it's, it's something that we do. We just, we do jujitsu, you know, it's, it's just, it's part of the thing. They can do an infinite other things, but I just, there's certain non-negotiables as a parent that I think you have to do. And kids do need rules. And I remember when my dad, when I was a teenager, when I was 14, my dad said, Hey, if you smoke, I'm going to kick you out of the house. That's a non-negotiable because there were kids that would smoke at school and he didn't want me going down that road. And I was like, okay, you know, like that was no, I never questioned it. I think I might have had a couple of puffs here and there at school once, and I was terrified that he could smell it on me. And I was like washing my face when I go home, brush my teeth, but like stuff like that. Like just there's, there's certain non-negotiables that you say. But if you give your kid a million things, he's not going to listen to you. And if you if you're really overbearing, a lot of time the kid will rebel and push back. That's human nature. So it's just picking and choosing your battles. I love that, and I think modeling modeling behaviors we talked about before is just so important. So if your kids see you training. Um, we try to do the same thing in the garage weight room. They always see either me or my wife training, um, you know, or, or doing some sort of outdoor activity and exercise and movement based, you know, work in addition to cooking, they see us cook. I don't ever want, you know, my son to think that it's, uh, abnormal for one or the other of the, his per parents, like not know how to do something. Oh, like you, you're the father, you don't know how to do laundry or, <laughs> you know, wash a plate or something because of traditional gender roles. Um, you know, and I grew up in a, in a household where the parents did sort of certain things. They, they kind of shared, but for the most part, it was one or the other in traditional roles. And we tend to do everything together so that they see that. And since I have a boy and a girl, I don't ever want my daughter to think like, yeah, well, your mother does the laundry. Cause like, that's just not, I don't want to model that behavior. Everybody has to clean their shit. Everybody has to cook stuff. Everybody harvests, you know, stuff from the garden. Um, all that modeling is always happening, right? All from back earlier in the conversation, we're talking about looking at the phone. Whatever it is that you're doing, they're watching all the time. And the world is always keeping score. Ayahuasca taught me that. So it's important to make sure that, you know, you are you're doing the right thing by them for how they will be years down the road because they'll remember just like you. Um, I think, however, Thomas, I think that's one. 
However, oh, can I just say, yeah, yeah, talking go ahead. about modeling. Sorry to interrupt. Talking about modeling, though, that's the most in, in, inspirational thing that I ever read on parenting is if it's not about what you say, it's about what they see you doing. In order for you to be the best parent, you have to be the, your best self. And that is so inspiring to me. Sorry, I just uh, wanted to say that. No, that's great. That's that's pretty much what I was trying to say in a, in a, in a more eloquent and succinct um, uh, manner. Um, one thing that is concerning to me, Lawrence, is that in the, I guess you would say, the, the modern state of sports for children, there is sort of this sense that everyone gets a medal. Um, I've kind of seen it in in the youth sports that we've done so far, soccer particularly, even after showing up for two two practices, if you get there and the timing is right with the last cycle, <laughs> you end up with a medal and you're like, I just started. You know, um, how do you feel about that? Like when, sh how should the reward system work with the child in youth athletics if they want to get to a very high level of jujitsu, like a black belt, like you, for example, if that's what you want for your son, how much do you let them win? Well, um, the I heard a wonderful thing by um, Hicks and Gracie. Um, he's one of the best, best ever Gracies to do it. And his father would take him and his boys, his brothers to compete when they were young. And there was so much pressure on them because they had that name on their back. And there was so much expectation to be a champion for the family. You know, your father and your grandfather and your uncles, everyone's champions. He used to say, if you win, I'll buy you an ice cream. But if you lose, I'll buy you two ice creams. And that was a way his dad just kind of took some of that pressure off him. But for me, I think I one thing that I learned with my first boxing fight, I was 23, my first amateur boxing fight. And I was single at the time. And I, I spent some time in New York and I had a girlfriend when I was in New York. And I was flirting with this girl at the New York office the whole time. Then I broke up with my girlfriend and the girl from New York came to visit in Chicago. And I was like, oh, you know, she's here for one night. We're going to, we're going to go out. It was the night before this, my first boxing fight. So we ended up having a very, very late night. I had a lot of fun. And then I got, I got, to, I did the fight and I ended up, I thought I won the first two rounds and lost the third, but I, he got the decision, whatever it's amateur boxing, the decisions are, are squirrely. But um, I remember the last round being absolutely exhausted. And then when I came home that night, I remember thinking, okay, I spent weeks and weeks training for this and I fought a good boxer in my first amateur fight and we went, we went to war and, but I was really tired. And the only thing that I could have controlled is being more disciplined with what I did the night before. And from that moment on, up until the, the last jujitsu match com com competition I had, there was hundreds of, whether it was jujitsu, MMA, boxing, hundreds of times I was competing. And I never, ever did that again, where I always did everything that I could within reason on my end. And then I let the chips fall where they may for the results. Because what makes combat sports exciting is you can be the better athlete on the day and you can still lose. That's why combat sports are exciting. Um, you know, and I, I won plenty and I, I lost plenty. And it never bothered me because I always did the best I could. There are some people that are wonderful gym fighters and then they compete to 20% of their ability. And I always felt like I was a pretty good competitor. I felt like I raised, I raised my standard from the gym to the competition um, arena. So um, that was a wonderful th thing that I found myself. And that's something that I want to pass on to him. It's like, listen, in jiu-jitsu, it's not like a lot of these sports. Like if you, if you win, you win. If you lose, you lose. The matches have win binary, it's win or lose. And I think when he's, when he's competing, if there's, when, when, when you, if he goes to a tournament, and there's no people in his weight class or there's no people in his belt class and he goes up a weight or he goes up a belt and he loses, I'm going to just have to talk to him about that and say, listen, like you, you challenge yourself and I, I, I'm so happy you, you, you put yourself in the arena and yeah, you lost to a bigger, stronger person, but that experience is invaluable. And there's a wonderful, um, I think it's a Hennessy commercial and Manny Pacquiao's in it and it shows him boxing in these rinky dinky shithole Bit, um, places when he was a kid in it, it shows a kid in the philippines you're assuming it's him but boxing and it, it's basically showing he came up it, it wasn't even proper boxing rings it was like these little tiny towns and people are betting on him and it was he went from that to fighting in the mgm grand for tens of millions of dollars and the whole world watching on pay-per-view and but he didn't just show up and go there he worked his way up and i think that's what i'm gonna have to i, I can't wait to have these conversations with with him is is you, when you get to the big stage, you've grown and you've developed mentally. And when you when you see these guys, and I never fought in UFC, but I fought in some big arenas. And when you walk out and there's thousands of people and there's lights on you, that wasn't the the first time I did that. The first time, my first amateur boxing fight, I remember 
I had seen locker rooms in TV and, you know, the, the guy has his own locker room and it's really nice and it's, you know, a big room and he's got his coach holding pads on. I remember there was like, you know, my opponent is like two feet down hitting pads with his coach <laughs> and he's bumped into me as I'm trying to warm up too. And then the bout before is like hitting my ankles because he's right behind me and there's just no room, you know, and then that was my first um, amateur boss fight. My first amateur MMA fight, I fought, I just fought once as an amateur it was for an amateur title and the, the show was called Babes and Brawls and it was wow. held in a strip club and in between the fights they had strippers and I'm there was no so there was all these strippers walking around and my coach was so funny he's like dear god I, we can't have this distraction Lawrence so he pulls me up into the, this little kitchen area where they're making you know fried wings and stuff and he's like we're gonna warm up in here so like my first MMA fight I'm warming up in a kitchen trying not to hit people walking up in and, in and out with wings and half naked strippers walking around getting food and you know you're, you're in it, it's all character development so I think that's what I want to tell my, my son is all these things in life you get priceless lessons like Records are for DJs. Win, win, win and losses doesn't mean anything in the early days. It really doesn't. It's all about development. And even one thing I love about MMA as opposed to boxing is some of the best fighters in MMA have a record, you know, 16 wins, 10 losses, you know, because they fought the absolute best in the world from day one. And MMA tends to be way more competitive. In boxing, there was an amateur that I beat twice as an amateur. He was very good. And I was a bit more experienced at the time. I think that's why I won those fights. He went on to have something like 20, 20 wins in a row as a pro. And he fought for a title. And he, when he finally fought someone really good, he ended up losing. But like this, this guy went on a crazy run as a professional because he's fighting people that are professional losers who shouldn't have even been there because he's trying to pad a record. And sure. you know, it, it's kind of a joke. So it, the one thing I love in, in, in sports that matter and the people, people, people that love you, don't care if you if you win or lose. They're going to love you either way. And people that do care are people that you shouldn't care about their opinion. So I, I just I, I'm I'm going to have all these lessons to tell him because I had to work through all myself um, without winning or losing. But I think it really it, we can't control people that are better than us. And, and the lovely phrase in jujitsu is you either win or you learn. So if you win, then it's validating that you're doing something right, and that's a positive experience. But if you learn, if you lose then you you can take something from that. Like, okay, that guy was more experienced, so I just have to keep competing and become a bit more experienced myself, a bit more of a savvy competitor. Or, you know what? That guy had really good wrestling and my stand-up sucks, so I'm going to work on wrestling the next six months. Or, you know, I just, I just, I didn't cut enough weight before and I was struggling to cut weight the day before and I had no energy. That's a mistake I'm never going to make it. So there's always something positive you can take. Uh, when you get to the black belt level and you're competing in these big tournaments, you know, I, I compete against multiple former um, adult world champions and we're competing in the masters divisions and um, you know so I had some of my best performances were losing but I felt like I performed my absolute best but I'm going against an absolute former world champion whose whole life was just jiu-jitsu he didn't do MMA he didn't do boxing he didn't have a career you know he didn't have multiple wow. careers um, you know, pressure because his whole life you know he has a gym and his whole life is jiu-jitsu and um, so th there's not much I can learn from that except that you know what he put more time in and I'm okay with that his whole life, he put way more hours in the mat. He should beat me. And, you know, it's not to say that I can't beat him on a good day if I have incredibly good luck, but nine times out of 10, I probably won't. And so, so there's always something you can take from, from competing with the right mindset. Um, I just, it's, there's nothing sadder though. Sorry, I know it's a bit of a long rant, Thomas, but there's nothing sadder than, um, a kid getting screamed at by a parent that's never achieved anything in their life. And that just breaks my heart. And I, I'll never, ever be that parent. I'm not going to live vicariously through my kid. And you know what? If my son says, I really don't enjoy competing, as long as he's still training and and, and getting the skills, I'm not going to push competing on, on him either. Because some people are really good at jujitsu, but they just don't enjoy the, um, the competition aspect. And that's okay too. Wow. Great answer. Um, you and I are both combat sports uh, enthusiasts. And I'm wondering, well, two things. When do you think it's appropriate for children to watch, start watching like from an early age? Is it okay to see kid, uh, you know, like Conor McGregor snap his leg or, you know, a brutal knockout? Um, I, I just, I'm, I don't know. My wife and I talk about this and we just don't know when we think it's appropriate for kids to start seeing that. Yes, it's a sports setting. Yes, it's a very controlled environment, but it's still quite brutal and and can be really, really violent and gory at the same time. You know, when is that okay? Um, my most uh, dramatic loss was um, three fights before I retired. And I got caught with a very explosive fighter with a beautiful 
shin wrapped around the neck head kick in the first 10 seconds of the match. And it was a significant blow that landed and it dropped me and the ref stopped it. And I said, what happened? I, I lost like 10 seconds of my life. And um, it, when I when I see brutal knockouts, having been there on the other side of them, it, it's always, I don't enjoy watching it. It's always painful. When I see horrible injuries, that's even worse, right? But uh, I don't enjoy watching that. I don't enjoy watching a guy get absolutely destroyed and beat down before he's finally stopped. I don't really enjoy it. I like seeing back and forth. I like seeing competitive matches. I love seeing the artistry and the skill, but I don't enjoy seeing that kind of stuff. Well, you're um, talking about right, like is... an example would be like Justin Gaethje versus Tony Ferguson, where he just got Ex absolutely yes. Exactly. Smashed. You just see a guy... You see a, a, an aging legend get beat down and probably lost a few years of his life and that exactly yeah right. that for me I don't I don't enjoy watching that it kind of hurts my soul a little bit you know um, so I, but I, I do watch the UFC and um, I actually watched some fights last night I had a kind of a frustrating day and I came home and I, I uh, my wife had thrown a pizza in the oven because I was I said I'm be home in twenty can you throw a frozen pizza I just wanted a frozen pizza and I wanted to watch some UFC and my son was walking around playing. Um, and he's kind of looking up at the screen and he's not really watching, but it's there. And um, I actually had the same thought. I said, I hope this is okay to, for it to be on in the background. Um, so he doesn't, it's not like he sits there and he watches it with me, but it's on and it's part of life. And the way I look at it is um, he's just going to think it's normal to watch um, professional MMA, just like it's normal that, you know, he goes to the gym, gym with dad. So I'm just trying to normalize it. Um, I'm not, you've actually given me something to think about. Maybe I'm a, I don't want to do him at a service because I, you know, I don't want him seeing violent murders on a TV show or something. And, um, you know, for his little brain, is it, is that going to impact the way he sees, you know, is he going to think it's normal to see people get kicked in the head and hit with four-ounce gloves? Um, I, yeah, well, yeah and you. like deep you gashes get... in the eyebrow. And it's like, you can't yeah. look away from blood. And with a movie, you can say, well, it's pretend, you know, this is entertainment. Yes. Although still, I don't think that's appropriate. But like with the kids, it's like, this is real that yes. he just got his yeah. nose broken and rearranged. It's like, well, why do yes. they do that? Is he, is he hurt badly? It's probably he is, but, but it's so that I can enjoy this with my buddies and high five and, and drink beers. It's mm -hmm. Nick and I have talked about this. It's really quite, it's difficult because we love deeply to our cores, combat sports and, you know, martial arts, but man, like whether it's okay for young children to see and engage in and feel like is normal is, I don't really know. And I'm glad to hear you talk about it because shit, I don't know, man. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, yeah. I think if, if it was a, a fight that was particularly gory and kind of bloody and I saw he was kind of like, maybe he's like playing with something and I see he stopped and he's kind of looking at the screen, I would probably stop it and distract him and do something else. Yeah, but I've right. definitely been a bit a bit careless. And the way I look at it is it's just, it's, it's the kind of like, again, what we do. We, we watch the UFC and we we train every day and we we do jujitsu and we jump in the cold plunge. That's just that's the life of being a Dunning and that's the life you're gonna live, you know. But you're right, it's uh, definitely something I should probably give a bit more thought to. Again, um, what's wonderful about these conversations, Thomas, is we haven't figured it all out. And yes. that's one thing I wanted to ask you: um, How's your relationship with your dad? It's it's uh I would say it's good. It's 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 always evolving. I helped them, you know, I was their realtor on the transaction for them to buy their house in Pasadena. We closed in December and that was the first time I had ever spent so much time, you know, communicating with my parents in a professional capacity. Prior to that, it had always been probably, you know, veiled attempts to get their attention. <laughs> like, look, I'm, uh, look, I'm doing this new thing or I'm doing that new thing and achieving this and hopefully you'll think that's cool. Um, as most children do. And this is the first time that it was like, you know, I get to flex and and do my thing at a professional level and help them get the best deal and change their life. It's been, but it's been tricky because, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've worked through over time um, with the ayahuasca and other stuff is, yeah, it's like, I think it all, it almost always relates to our parents and, and our relationship with them and, and how we were perceived, what we could have done differently, why, you know, we weren't seen the way that we wanted to be seen, what have you. I, I think a lot of my stuff was, um, without talking too much about it, um, cause I want to focus on you and dads, but I think it's, you know, as a middle child, feeling invisible in spite of the things that I was doing was a big part of it. And just wishing, you know, that there was a little bit more guidance there 
my dad was mm -hmm. always gone. He was in the military, army intelligence and doing important things, you know, and it was always about service. And I think what I didn't really understand as a kid was like, why is the service of, you know, <laughs> I, I couldn't understand it possibly, right? Like the service to your country is far more important than the service to your family. And, you know, I still haven't squared myself with it. I, I haven't figured it out because I'm sure he would like to, on his deathbed, think about all the times with, you know, his family rather than all those times he was out working for other colonels or generals or, you know, commanding a battalion of troops. Actually, I don't know. I should ask him. I'm I'm hoping to be able to do that. But it's it's evolving. I'll say that, you know, now that they're moving closer, hopefully we get to see each other a lot more and just have conversations about parenting and, you know, what he wishes he would have done differently so that I can avoid making the same mistakes with my kid, you know, and my, my kids, because there's a lot of it. There's a lot of carryover. You're, you're more like your father than you can possibly imagine. And even if he wasn't around a lot. And so that's great in many ways and in many ways not. So if you expect certain things out of your kid, because they were expected out of you, you better check yourself and really think think about whether that's the most appropriate thing for your child where they are. Well, I'm so glad you said that. Um, I'm finding myself either saying or thinking things that he said to me when he was when I was young. So because I'm I became a father at 41 and he had me at 30. Um, it's a really crazy. I, I have these really strong, clear memories of conversations we had. You know, when I was 12 or 13. And we'd see a movie and then he would tell me, you know, he's like, oh, don't listen to me. And I'm kind of cynical now. And he would say he'd say things about it. And I'm thinking, man, he's exactly the same age that I am now. And I kind of understand what he means now. Um, so that, that there's so, so much truth to that. But um, the idea of um, I just want to say something to anyone listening or watching. If you have kind of a strained relationship with your father um, or either of your parents, there's a song by James Blunt and it's called Monsters. And um my my good friend, um, his father is in, in the ER. Um, he's he's got had some long long term um, illness, and and I'm not sure how long he has left. And my poor son has been, uh, my poor friend has been having a really tough time the last few weeks. And he sent it to me and said, Lawrence, like listen to this song. He said someone sent it to him, and he said he was driving and he, he had to pull over and he just burst into tears. And it is such an emotional song. It's about he's he's with his dad. I think his dad is dying, and he said, you know, it's no longer father and son anymore. It's just two 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 humans, and it's it's not about the regrets. We we both made mistakes, but it's just about um, the two of us here today. And now I'm going to be chasing the monsters away for you because you know you're you're dying, and that's what you did when I was young. Oh. And holy shit. Thomas, like even just talking about it now is making me uh, <laughs> cry. And it's, and it's just, yeah, it's, so I, I've got this, um, talking about that, about that first year in parenting, in parenthood that, that was really difficult. Um, there was a couple of times I wasn't my best self um, when I went home. One, one time my parents have a place in the south of France. My mom's from France originally. And so I went to see them one summer in France and then in England for Christmas. And both times between the jet lag and my son being young and my wife and I were kind of bickering and she was a little sick on one of the trips and we just weren't our best selves. And, and I didn't feel like we, they were kind of being a bit critical to, towards us with our parenting and it kind of rubbed us the wrong way. And I kind of got into it with my brother and in Christmas and it was just, it was really negative, the whole thing. And honestly, Thomas, it kind of pissed me off because I was always a really, really good son. Um, I was a good kid when I was young. I didn't get into trouble. I did what my parents told me to. Um, I always worked hard. I had jobs since I was a you know, very young teenager. And um, as an adult, you know, I've always tried to do nice things to my parents. I've taken them on some nice trips to Hawaii and you know, to, to different places. And um, I've always tried to be a good son. And I felt like they, they took me at uh, my worst moment. And they kind of judged me for it and it really pissed me off. And the last time I saw them, I actually didn't go back the last two years for Christmas because it, it annoyed me, um, was they kind of, they my dad wrote me this letter, kind of very, almost like a, it, it wasn't a nice, like, like here's some fatherly advice letter. It was almost kind of like, this is where you're fucking up letter. And um, they gave it to my wife and she she read it and she said, Lawrence, like, I'm not going to give this to you because I know it's going to make you angry. And she kind of told me what it was about. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to read that, throw it out. And it did piss me off. And um, so for the last two years, I've been feeling very, very distant from them. And that song really impacted me because they're coming next week, next weekend, they're coming for a week and they've never been to Indiana. They've never been here. And 
my dad just turned 75. It's his birthday today. And I'm going to call him after we finish this, actually. But it's like, I listened to that song and I realized that I'm a human who's doing his best. And I've made so many mistakes in my life and I'm riddled with faults and I'm, I'm just doing my best. That's why we're all doing our best here. So anyone going through tough times, number one, don't be hard on yourself because a lot of people, their self-talk is so much harsher than they would ever say to a friend of theirs. So watch your self-talk and just give yourself a bit of grace because we're, we're all doing our best. And it doesn't matter how many times you fucked up, you, do, you did the best with what you had at the time. And, um, and the other thing is just don't... Uh, don't wait until your dad's on the on your deathbed to to mend a bridge and that's one thing that is just it really it, this just happened the last few days my friend sent this to me and i know what he's going through and he's incredibly close to his father and his father's really young and it's just so tragic um and i just now i'm a dad too i just i have a bit more i have a bit more grace for things that it's not that i have resentments my parents did, did the best they were young parents and that they were wonderful parents and I'm talking about every generation that does better you know look at my dad's upbringing with this crazy strict authoritarian german father who treated he would have steak at the table and meanwhile my dad and his three brothers would have like um milk white bread and sugar and they would just dip the bread in the milk and then the sugar that you know that, that that was their diet they didn't they were very very poor they only had enough money for one piece of meat so my granddad ate it and you know the, the wow. kids had nothing that was his that was his upbringing he never I don't, think, I don't think his dad ever told him he loved him you know i tell my son 20 times a day i love him so it's just it, every generation does better um but i just i'm determined i just wanted to share that with you because it's really been on my mind as a, as a as a father is um do, we're all doing our best so number one, be be kind with yourself, but also don't wait until it's too late because I've really been asking myself a lot the last two years. I was like, if my parents passed away tomorrow, would I regret the way I am being distant from them and not going to see them? And I was like, I don't think I would because like it's kind of on them to see me and make the effort. You know, I've got a lot more going on. My dad's retired. I've got a lot more going on in my life right now. I'm, I'm juggling a lot of different things. I got screwed over by a contractor. My finances are not where I want to be, blah, blah, blah. I've got all these excuses where I'm so busy. But then on the other side, it's like, dude, he's 75 years old. He's like, give him some grace as well. And so for me, I just, that, that song really spoke to me and I'm, I'm determined to be my best self next week when they come. And I'm just, I'm just going to all the resentment and all the, the, the irritation of the last few years, I'm just going to let it go. You know, it's just, it, life is too short. And when all said and done, Thomas, like, are we really going to care about the prestige and the Instagram followers and the way people look up to us and the zeros in their bank account. No, we're not going to care for any of that stuff. We're only going to care about our very close friends and family and the, the wonderful time we spend with people we love. That's it. That's all that matters in life. And so, you know, we've all got complicated um, relationships with our family. I think it was Ram Dass that said, if you think you're enlightened, go home for a week at Thanksgiving and then see if you're still enlightened. So, you know, <laughs> we, we, we all have it, right, Thomas? We all have complicated relationships with our family. <laughs> But it's just, I'm just, I'm just over it all. Like, I don't want to have any negativity towards them. I don't want to have any bitterness. I don't want to have any resentment. I'm incredibly grateful. They they could have, they, they did a really good job raising me. I was incredibly lucky. I was raised in a two-parent household in a nice suburb of London. Like, what the hell do I have to complain about? You know, and I'll try and do better with my kids. You know, I'll, I'll try if I can. I'll try and be my best self. But I'm not going to let any resentment um, impact. You know, I don't know how long I'm going to have with them. So I just, I, I, sorry, I, I know I'm, bit emotional but i just i wanted to share that with you because it's really been on my mind the last two days and when you're talking about parenting and the way you are with your kids it's also the way you are with your parents as well wow well i was going to ask you for any parting advice for dads but you just nailed it thank you so much for being my inaugural guest and challenging me in so many ways as you always do and how i think lawrence dunning ladies and gentlemen thank you so much uh, i can't wait to do it again it's been a massive honor and honor to Thomas. I'm sending you a lot of love from the Midwest and I really hope to see you soon. Thank you, brother. Hasta pronto.